the real India is beginning to happen now. The real India is beginning to happen. You know, I often say that we had our first freedom in 1947. That is obvious, the political freedom. Do you know when we had our second freedom? Do you know? 1991. Second freedom. When we liberalized, when we opened up. Okay? Dr. Manmohan Singh, our Prime Minister, was then the Finance Minister, was responsible for that. That was freedom to compete. Until that time, we were closeted from around the rest of the world. We are scared of the competition. Right? And we said, no, now we are not, and we will integrate our trade and economics with the rest of the world. Until that time, if you see the industry, industry produced gums which did not stick. People bought them. Industry produced plugs which did not fit. People bought them. Industry produced uh, cars where everything other than the horn made noise. <laughs> People bought them. Because it was seller's market, right? No competition was allowed. It was only in 1993 that Radhan Tata was allowed to make Indica, not before that. And Indica is of course a great uh, success story. So the issue that I am trying to raise is that before 1991, we were a closed economy and after 1991 we opened up. And that is why last year in 2007 when people were celebrating India at 60, I said no, India at 16. India at 16, a young kid, you know, which has just learned to walk and compete because you have to compete with the rest of the world and show your mind, not when you are protected. I would say that was the second freedom. And you know what is the third freedom? One, two, three. All right, yesterday I was with uh, Anil Kakodkar, Vijay was there. We warmly hugged him and congratulated him on what you have been able to do. It had nothing to do with the nuclear deal. It had nothing to do... Uh, with the 20,000 megawatt that we'll get by 2020. No. It goes far beyond it. It's the third freedom, the technology freedom. Because the access to dual use technology, which we did not have, we are going to have now. And you'll just see the magical transformation because we are left out. Unlike Taiwan, Korea, who had all the access and see what they did. We are not able to. And therefore we kept on missing uh, the buses. You do not know how severe the problems were. When I was the Director General of Council of Scientific and Industrial Research, CSR, we had our laboratory, National Aerospace Laboratory, we had uh, this uh, 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 great project SARAS, 14-seater aircraft, because I had this dream, we all had this dream, that uh, we have to make it happen in civil aviation with small aircraft to start with. All right? There is always, uh, let's say, uh, in a thousand mile journey, the first uh, few steps that you have to take. And I remember there was something like 15,044 components in that plane and there was one component, starter generator, which we were denied access to because of dual use technology considerations. And you know Samir, how much the project got delayed by? 18 months. One component out of 15,000. So by lack of access to these dual use technology, you just don't know the, 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 uh, the, the, the progress that have been halted and suddenly this third freedom is going to give us access to that. So, my young friends, I want to tell you that you will enjoy the fruits of not only the second freedom, but the third freedom that we have. The fourth freedom is something that you have to do, develop yourself by freeing your minds and saying that, yes, I am going to compete, I am going to win, like Samir. Why I was so very pleased and I said immediately, yes, was I saw you having that fourth freedom where you wanted to look at biorefinery, not just in the Indian contest, in the global contest and you want to win in the global context, all right? I'm not interested, by the way, that you are the first in Ghatkopar, you are the first in uh, Parla, you are the first in Bombay, you are the first in Maharashtra, you are the first in India. I just don't care. You have to be the first in the world. How, how do we do that? I think that is the spirit that we must imbibe uh, uh, Samir, all right? That is one message I like to leave with you. The second message uh, that I want to sort of dwell on is, I love this theme of human face of technology, by the way, something that is extremely close to my heart. I am going to speak uh, uh, sort of about this uh, uh, topic uh, for a few minutes and particularly tell you what your responsibilities will be in terms of looking at the human face of technology. But let me 
get back to the fundamentals. I think engineering is a great profession, so as to say, and I'm delighted that we are all uh, engineers because uh, we engineer the future, by the way. We are the future, very frankly. And there are lots of challenges that this world is facing today where engineers are going to play uh, the most critical role. And I'll explain uh, why I'm saying that. But what are the kinds of engineers we need to produce as we move along? I think the first thing that we need to understand is that the borders between different disciplines are vanishing. That's why, Samir, I was very happy to see the word engineering science embedded in your vision. Engineering science. It's extremely important. The border between engineering and science itself is vanishing. I remember around 15 years ago in London I gave this talk on seamless chemical engineering science, the emerging paradigm. This was named after one of our great chemical engineers who founded chemical engineering, Professor P. V. Dankworth from Cambridge. Seamless chemical engineering science. The borders between engineering and science basically vanishing. Borders between different engineering uh, they are vanishing. In fact, eventually, at the end, engineering just has to provide a solution. What tools, what techniques, from which discipline he uses is immaterial. Whether he's building a bridge or creating an artificial heart, one doesn't really care. How, how, how does he sort of bring that in? That is one. The second is that we have to create not only borderless engineers, we have to create integrative engineers. How? How? We can create engineers who are able to synthesize, you know. It's like orchestra, right? You have different instruments, okay? And there comes a conductor who creates a symphony, who creates a synthesis, <coughs> basically. And there is a new product that comes out for which you are prepared to pay a thousand dollar ticket. The same instruments. So therefore, many times what happens is that you look at a product like this and you say, oh, it's a new product that has been created. But this is not a new technology. What, what is this? This is synthesis of eight or nine known technologies. But created in such a way that you have a word beating product. All right? So how do we create integrative engineers who integrate different things and their integration capacity has to be also such that they are able to integrate the thinking with regard to not only natural sciences, engineering, natural sciences, social sciences, whole range of things. I think that's, that's going to be the big challenge. Third is, I personally believe that for 21st century we have a big challenge. And the big challenge was summarized by Professor Martin Rees, the president of Royal Society, who spoke last year in Delhi. I presided over that lecture in my capacity as president of Indian National Science Academy because this award, Blackett Memorial Lecture, uh, a memorial award, is given through Indian National Science Academy. You know what was the title of his lecture? Very interesting. 21st century. Will the civilization survive the 21st century? I can tell you, Vijay, by the time we came out, we were sweating. It was a frightening picture because he was talking about the global warming, the ozone layer depletion, the ravaging of biodiversity. And he wondered, we have just taken the first steps in the 21st century. Will we survive the 21st century? Right? And he's right. And suddenly, I mean, issues of global warming, and I'm very happy you covered it in Nish, are becoming so critical. And when people look at low carbon fuel, low carbon fuel, carbon neutral home, etc., who is going to deliver that? These are going to be delivered by engineers, basically. Engineers are going to save us, uh, save for the 21st century. But to me, even more important than that is the following. You know, Forget about electrical engineering, chemical engineering, aeronautical engineering, metallurgical engineering. There is only one engineering that will save this 21st century. Gandhian engineering. Now what is Gandhian engineering? Gandhian engineering is uh, getting more from less. Well, you will say more from